Okay, it's 12.02 and we're going to start. Thank you everyone for being here. And thank you, Bibiana. Thank you so much for having me. No, it's awesome to be here. Thank you everyone. My name is Trina Obonna and I'm going to be the host for um, our webinar today. And we have our lovely Bibiana here and we're going to be talking about drug search within the current market. Sorry, I'm just admitting people as... No, that's okay. I'm talking, and all. Our session is going to run, um, Bibiana is going to be giving us her presentation and that's going to run for about 30 to 40 minutes. Then we're going to have about 10 minutes for some questions and answers. So please feel free to jot down your questions. Um, Bibiana is very much okay with people interrupting her. She says she wants this to be a conversation. Um, so if you do have a nugging qu question that you really need answered or something she says catches your attention and you really want to know, have a question about what she's saying, please feel free to either use the chat room that we have at the bottom. Feel free to use the chat and we can interrupt her nicely or you can use the raising hand um, option as well. That would also work. This is a this is one of our business um, webinars series. We have a series running for the next six weeks. This is our second one. After this, we have four more. And we will be excited to have you guys join us. If you want to have no more information, our BCW website, Business um, Black Canadian Women in Action, please do visit the website and it gives you the details of the other presentations and the other conversations that we're going to be having over the next six weeks. But thank you very much for being here. I'm not going to introduce Bibiana because I know Bibiana, you're going to be doing that yourself. So please welcome her. Um, Please be ready to listen, engage, and do ask questions, as I said, as we go along. So thank you. So Bibian, I'm gonna pass it over to you now. Incredible, and I can still share my screen with you, correct? Correct. Okay, perfect. Can everyone see my screen? Or can you at least see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, perfect. So again, thank you so much for everyone for being here today. I really, really appreciate your time. Um, fun fact, 76% of people are uh, have a fear of public speaking and I will admit that I'm one of them. So I really thank you to BCW for allowing me to conquer um, one of my challenges. I'm uh, very excited to be here today to talk to everyone and um, hopefully give you some insight on what's going on in the market. Uh, just follow along with my slide. So basically today, obviously, I want to talk a bit about myself, um, talk about career in terms of where I've been with Robert Half, the effects of COVID, um, some of the industries um, that were most affected and least affected, um, as well as unemployment statistics, because I am an accountant by trade, um, securing the bag, how to get that job, talking about resume tips, interview tips, um, learning and development, of course, networking, which I find very, very useful. Um, of course, if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask them as we go through this presentation. So um, first thing I want to start with my story. Um, you know, unfortunately, this is not me. I love her beautiful hair, so I thought I'd share this picture. I'm a senior accountant um, in audits turned recruiting manager. So um, basically a bit of background on me. So I am originally from Zambia. Uh, grew up there, went to high school in South Africa, graduated relatively young. So at 15, I graduated. And at that point, like I knew one thing that was really close to my heart is just uh, being able to serve people. So I actually wanted to do an economics degree. Um, so I went to Texas to do that, University of North Texas. Um, and then I spoke to one of my, uh, my dad's friends who told me, you know, if I wanted to come back home and wanted to make a difference, unfortunately as a woman, your voice isn't as heard so that crushed my whole life but it's okay life went on um, so after a year in Texas I did move to Winnipeg so went from sunny Texas to Winterpeg uh, where I did a BCom in accounting at the University of Manitoba um, while I was there, um, you know, my last year I did a summer internship. KPMG was one of the top places that I really wanted to go. Uh, so KPMG luckily put me on for their internship that they had. I did a summer internship with them for uh, four months. Before I graduated, they offered me the job. So I jumped into KPMG right after graduation. Um, I just want to put this point out. If you or anyone that you know, uh, you know, is in any programs, I would really 
encourage you to do any internships or co-ops while you're in university. I find like most of the time there's this push to graduate. However, if you're graduating with no um, experience, it's a little bit hard to actually get into the job market. So after um, KPMG, you know, I was a senior um, accountant there. When I left, I had some really great experience and I was able to travel across Canada um, doing audit work. It was a great experience, not only in, in Winnipeg, but as well as Calgary, Vancouver. I went out to Rankin Inlet in Nunavut. So it was really, really great experience. And I got to see a lot of Canada out of that. After about three years, I realized audit wasn't necessarily my call <laughs> and I wanted to venture into something else. So um, I decided I actually wanted to leave Winnipeg as a whole and I moved to Toronto for about seven months. Uh, there I worked with an organization where I was able to um, work with a, basically an entertainment company that films all the shows that are like, you know, how to get away with, uh, with murder, um, The Bachelor, they do really cool shows. Uh, so they're in the process of doing an integration and a merger with six other companies. So I was helping out on the change management side of things and I really realized my passion for helping out and, you know, implementing change. Um, after seven months in Toronto, I realized that Toronto wasn't for me and I moved to Ottawa and I came in for an interview at Robert Half. While I was in here, someone, the recruiting manager suggested to me, like, why not become a recruiter? And I was like, what on earth is a recruiter? <laughs> so, you know, thankfully I actually took that leap of faith and I joined Robert Half in the beginning of 2018. And I was able to start as both uh, business development as well as uh, recruiting. So business development is really just sales. And I will be completely honest, I suck at sales because I hate salespeople talking to me and forcing me to do stuff. So I felt this way, it just didn't really mesh with me, but recruiting really spoke to me because I was still using my degree in some capacity, being able to talk to people about their career, being able to talk to people about accounting-based work, and also just being able to catch anyone that's falsifying their experience. So that really worked out well for me. So I did um, you know, a couple of years in more transactional roles, recruiting for more transactional roles. And eventually I ventured out and my manager saw my recruiting potential and promoted me into more senior level recruiting, and which is what I'm doing right now. So I recruit for um, senior level positions, be it CFOs, directors of finance, um, you know, directors of HR, a range of different uh, roles that I recruit for at the moment. Um, aside from that, I also meet with several different people at any given time. So I interview about 15 to 17 people on a weekly basis. And out of, um, you know, something that I'm really proud of is in 2019 alone, out of all of the people that I got to interviews with our clients, I placed 80% of those candidates. So uh, definitely really challenging, but really having an understanding of how, what our clients are looking for and recruiting the top talent. Um, of course, I wouldn't even be in this conversation without being a part of Robert Half. So I definitely want to just kind of give an uh, overlook on dealing with recruiting firms as well as like dealing with Robert Half. So um, as I mentioned, you know, I work with a management resource team that sources for more management level positions. Um, aside from that, if you are looking to work with a recruiting firm, I urge everyone to look for a recruiting firm that's in line with what they're currently career-wise. So you can Google any recruiting firms that support your line of, um, of specialization. But within Robert Half, we've got the account temps division that deals with more transactional roles, which I've done before the recruiting in that capacity, as well as the finance and accounting uh, team that deals with all permanent roles uh, within um, you know, accounting and finance. Uh, office team deals with a lot of administrative based work and then we've got our technology development um, technology division rather that deals with all you know technology based things I always say when I see SQL or scrum I'm thinking that's within the technology division we've got our legal team for all the lawyers TCG for anything within marketing advertising um, a range of different roles as well as productivity which deals with all 
um, you know, senior, senior, C-suite level people, anyone making over 150K, productivity is where you would probably be looking. So again, there's a range of different lines of business that can support you through your job search. So one of the things, obviously we know right now, we are going through COVID, which is a pandemic that nobody expected. It's really been a hardship, not only for my, like for my, my colleagues, but as well as, you know, so many of the consultants that we work with. Um, one of the struggles that we find through COVID or one of the eye-opening situations was the fact that working from home, which was typically seen as taboo or typically seen as a hardship, has actually become a normal, you know, line of work. So the perception of working from home has really changed through this COVID period and a lot of our clients have realized that. So being able to, you know, not only micromanage, like being micromanaged, that doesn't happen as much because you have to trust the employees that you work with. Dealing in meetings. So right now, if you're in meetings, there could be distractions. There could be a crying child. There could be a dog or a cat or an animal, you know, just any of your pets in the background. And people have got more used to that and realize that working from home is not as difficult as you would think it is. Um, a big thing that I would say through working from home is you have to over communicate through this time. Um, obviously, if you're not online for five hours, your manager is wondering where you are. So just being as transparent as possible is super important through this time. Another effect of COVID that we're seeing is a lot of people feeling a sense of job insecurity through this time. When is my job going to be cut off? When are the hardships going to hit my company? Um, as much as that's happening, I want to tell anyone who may feel that way, it's not just you that feels that way. It's so many people that feel a, a sense of job insecurity. Um, I say to everyone, if you feel that way and if you understand the line of business you're in and think that job cuts are happening, be proactive. Update your resume and see other opportunities, opportunities that are out there because there are several opportunities that you can transition into. Another one of the effects that we're seeing, at least company-wide through COVID, is the effect on mental health. Um, I think that's a very important factor, especially as, um, you know, I feel like in the Black community, mental health sometimes can be, um, you know, not as appreciated or not considered as much as it should be. But seven out of 10 employees have stated to, um, to us through surveys that this is the most stressful period that they've had in their professional career. They have to put into consideration that there's a lot of Gen Y and Gen Z people going through this, uh, through this pandemic. So they did not expect this. Um, in Quebec alone, 50% of the people have reported mental health issues through this time. So I definitely encourage everyone Everybody, that if in any capacity you are feeling, um, you know, stressed out, take some vacation time. You know, more people apparently, you know, according to statistics, more people, uh, management rather, is encouraging more of their staff to, um, you know, take more vacations because during this time you need it more than anything. So next, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> I'm going to talk about some of the industries that are most and least affected. Um, naturally, the accommodation and food services industry, arts and entertainment, recreation, anything that involves, you know, um, shows or anything of, or movie theaters, they were most affected as well as transportation, retail trade and oil and gas in, um, extraction. So that really just speaks to the fact that like, you know, this time, um, unfortunately, all of the uh, all of the service industries were most affected because you can't really work during a pandemic like COVID. Um, on the flip side, there are some industries that were least affected, being manufacturing, accounting and finance, um, IT, um, anything like web developers, IT consultants. Even within our company, we have been hiring for more of those positions right now on the technology front. Nurses and healthcare workers. Um, obviously, we need as much of that support as possible through this time. Civil engineers on the construction side, um, because construction was one of the um, one of the industries that were not um, cut down. They're still deemed an essential service, so we've been able to still uh, you know fill roles in that capacity. And surprisingly to me at least, call center representatives. So that's more administrative, but call center representatives, a lot of companies through this time have still needed that call center support because 
you know, there's a lot of online orders and things like that. So being able to support, um, you know, the online uh, online orders and that traction online through call center representatives, there's been a leap in that capacity. And with that is anything in the accounts receivable side of things. So dealing with um, AR collections, anything along that uh, realm of work. So of course I'm an accountant, so I definitely wanted to look at some of the statistics. Um, so I've got this um, stat over the last year. So in January, actually, we saw unemployment being 5.5%, February 5.6%, March 7.8%, April 13%, March, and then May 13.7%. Um, coupled with that was there was a lot of removal for, from jobs in the economy. So one million jobs were removed from um, the Canadian economy, both in March and April. So over one million actually were removed in March and April. So definitely a huge hit to the economy. However, I'm super optimistic because May we are seeing an increase in jobs being added. It's worth noting that historically, jobs have always been added, at least in the last three years. And in the last seven years, we have not seen unemployment less than the five to 7% mark. So COVID definitely took a hit on our economy. We're looking at it on a province by province statement, um, basis rather. Um, we see places like um, Alberta who were already facing an oil crisis before COVID. Uh, being hit the most, whereas Manitoba that deals with a lot of agriculture based work um, was not affected as much because of just the industry they have. Um, I also got some statistics. So the difference in strength of the rebound for men and women in low wage work was also seen for total unemployment. So total employment increased more than twice as fast for men uh, um, as opposed to women in May, resulting in a greater uh, proportion of employment loss experienced in March and April being recovered among men compared to women. So as a woman, I was like, really? These men really have us <laughs> having a run for our money. Um, this is also consistent with the more rapid increase in goods producing industries, which account for a greater proportion of male employment than female employment. Um, among parents, women less than women see less employment increase than men and are more, more likely to lose hours. Aside from that, so obviously we're all here for one cause and like, you know, we do want to make sure that we're still, you know, getting our jobs and making sure that we're securing the back as I pointed over here. So I definitely want to talk about things like your resume, interviewing tips, um, the offer letter that you get. So I will dive in more on resume as well as interviewing tips um, through this uh, through this presentation. But one thing that I do want to say is that, um, you know, 39% of senior managers said they discuss um, pay on their first interview and 25% say they discuss pay on the second interview. So going into interviews, knowing what you're expecting pay wise is super important. Another statistic that I pulled up was 80% of Canadian employers are concerned about holding on to top talent. So some of the tactics that they use is increased employee communication, improved recognition programs, providing professional development, more money top, um, as well as the fact that more money top the list of why people stay in their roles. So that's more talking to the offer stage. So whenever you're thinking like, or oh, should I should I ask for more money when I get an offer or should I not? You need to understand you're very valuable to employers. So do not be afraid to ask for more when you're getting an offer. Very interesting to me was only 36% of workers in Canada tried to negotiate a higher salary with their last job offer. So that speaks a lot to um, you know, us as a whole, you know, like if you are given a job, once they get to that offer stage, they absolutely want you. So there is no reason for you not to counter offer or do your market research and figure out ways that you can increase your initial pay when you get a job. So going on to resumes, uh, this is my favorite topic because I look at hundreds of resumes on a weekly basis and some are really interesting, some are <laughs> 
are really interesting. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's really a range of different things that we see. And you have to realize, like, whenever recruiters or any hiring managers are looking at your resume, on average, they're looking at it maybe 20 to 30 30 seconds, right? So if in the first 30 seconds you're not seeing anything that is of relevance to them, your resume is going to be pushed to the side and you don't want to do that. So some of the tips that I would suggest to everybody that may be either looking for a new job or that may be, you know, at a stage where um, they're on furlough and want to explore new options is make sure your resume is as strong as possible. Um, make sure that you're actually applying for jobs that are relevant to your experience. Some of the do's that I um, stated here is keep your resume succinct, which means keep it as concise as possible. Make sure that everything on your resume is relevant information to anybody looking to hire you for a job. Um, list positions in reverse chronological order. And basically what that means is you know, you have to make sure that your more recent experience is right at the top and then all of your, you know, little jobs that maybe you had in university or in college are right at the bottom. Um, as well as I always say to my candidates, like, there's no reason to put like four or five points as to what you did in college that's got nothing to do with what you're applying for right now, right? So for me, for example, I worked at the University of Manitoba call center. On my resume, I've got no points on what I did at the call center because it's not relevant to what I'm trying to do as I progress in my career. So focus on your accomplishments. Something that we see really common right now is a lot of people putting not only what they've done in their jobs, but an achievement. So say for instance, if you're in marketing, through my time at X company, I was able to increase sales by X amount. Um, things like that, just to show what your value add is, what your return on investment is for anybody who's reviewing your resume. Um, highlighted, re highlight related skills. So I always say to people, like if say for instance, you're applying for a job that's got nothing to do, like if you, like that's got nothing to do with what you've already done, unfortunately you may not get the call. Like I'll be as truthful as honest as possible rather. Um, I staff for director of finance roles and I get resumes that's like a cashier at Tim Hortons. Unfortunately, that person is not at a stage where I could be, you know, hiring you for a director of finance because you don't have that experience. Um, so make sure that you're highlighting what's on the job description. If they're saying they're looking for somebody who's got IFRS experience, make sure your resume has got as many points where you've reported under IFRS. And of course, I'm linking this to more of accounting roles. Um, include keywords. To be honest, we all use shortcuts, so it's a lot of Boolean searches. So make sure that on your resume, there's the keywords that are reflected on the job description. So if they're looking for um, certain software, if they're looking for a certain, sorry. Okay, so if they're looking for certain software, looking for certain skill sets, make sure all those keywords are included in your resume because you will be screening yourself out if it is not reflected on your resume. Some of the don'ts and some things that we do see, excuse me, including your photograph. Um, I find like sometimes with more um, C-suite positions, people do include their photographs, but honestly, I think, um, and most of my colleagues agree that a photograph is not a necessary um, thing to include on your resume. Um, a lot of people choose to put company specific jargon, or, you know, like talking about, oh, we did the HFFG, like no one knows what that means. So talking about acronyms that are related to your previous role and including that on your resume makes no sense to somebody reviewing your resume. Um, you need to also bear in mind the fact that like most of the times, people that are reviewing your resume are HR professionals that may not have worked in an industry that you've worked in. So may, it's like always make sure that all of the jargon and like kind of dumb your resume down to ensure that the person that's doing the initial pre-screen is able to understand what you've done. Sorry, so she, did you have a question? I did. Well, just to have, a, um, I see there's a couple of questions in our chat that I thought, and I know you wanted to make this conversational. 
So that, I think you've hit some points that people are, you know, want to ask about. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start from the first question um, and it says, for your company that you work for, do they also have headhunters? And what is the difference between job hunters and dealing with your recruitment company? Okay, so I mean, yes, we are quote unquote headhunters. So with a recruiting firm in general, we are constantly looking to, to staff positions that we would put like staff for right now and in the long run. So people would say like we're quote unquote head, head, headhunters in itself. So there's no real big difference between the two. We're both constantly looking at the best talent on the market to supply for potential roles that we may have. Okay, thank you. Second question we had is, what's the best way to start the conversation for more money once you've been working for a company for a few years? Yeah, that's a really great question. So, I mean, I think it's more so, and when you have your performance reviews, um, you can go ahead and talk to your management team. So every company has got yearly performance reviews. The best way is to state what you've done and what you've accomplished in that year. That's in line with your specific, um, you know, um, KPIs, what you were supposed to achieve. So the best way I would say is say, okay, so this year I've done A, B, C, D, which is what you, what per our last meeting, you said you're looking to achieve. With that said, I've looked at the market. I've looked at the market and I've salaries for people in my position, and right now they're making X amount. They're making a hundred thousand, and with that, I would like to see if there's an opportunity for me to be uh, to get that pay raise. So I would say that's the best way. So having as much research as possible, as well as showing what your value add was for the for the last year would be a great way to just include that. And the worst thing that could really happen is them saying no. Okay. Thanks, Viviana. Um, another question I have, how about answering behavioral interview questions for a person who has little experience and or did not face tough situations? Uh, so as I, um, my next slide actually t um, touches on more interview questions. So um, I can definitely circle back on that. But on behavioral things, I mean, behavioral situations don't necessarily have to be in the workplace. It could be in university, it could be in life in general. When was the last time that you've had to deal with a confrontational experience? Well, when I was working on a group project, some people did not under like you know did not agree with what my points were or whatever the case is. Like people always think it has to be for your first job. It doesn't necessarily always have to be work experience because that's what you're trying to build, right? So it could be just life experiences where you've dealt with a hard situation, how you overcame it. So I'm going to talk about the star star technique, which talks about what the situation was, what the task was, how you overcame it, as well as what the results of your actions were. Okay, thank you. And the last question, just before you move on, okay. do you have any stats collected for minority retention? How do we know Robert Half puts their best foot forward regardless of race? And basically, how do you tackle job profiling? That's a really great question. Um, so unfortunately, I do not have those statistics available at this point. Um, I will say Robert Half in, in, in particular, um, if I look in my office space, we are such a melting pot. Like there's so many different people, right? So, um, and different backgrounds, like on my team, I'm the youngest in my team, but I've got a person that's retiring in two years who deals on the sales side. Um, on top of that, like we do try and make sure that we are um, representing a diverse group. I will say because we are a multinational company that's um, located in like 300 different, um, like we've got 300 different offices. I know some people that may have maybe faith a sense of like not feeling like they're um, like the, the race pl played a factor but in the Ottawa Calgary Toronto office I've never heard of any complaints and it's really what your skill set is in hiring for the best fit okay thank you and thank you everyone for the questions do keep them coming um Viviana I'll allow you to go on though and we'll revisit the questions exactly I get to drink some water when you ask questions awesome yeah, so on top of that, so as I was saying, in terms of resume tips, personal information, which is becoming kind of um, a hot topic right now, whether to put your address or not. 
Um, I would say put your uh, postal code. Most of the time, you know, put personal information, like don't put your set number. Don't put your um, you know, going back to what the do's are in terms of mentioning relevant experience, don't mention about experience, but again, if you're applying for a role that requires you to, let's say, for instance, financial statements, you do not need to put your experience as a bouncer in first year university or you know whatever the case is. Um, so make sure your your experience is relevant for the roles. Um, another pet peeve that I know a lot of us HR HR folk have is inconsistent font. So that ties in with spelling typos. Like I say to everyone, once you've done your resume, ask one of your friends to look over your resume and just be able to see like, hey, are there any typos? Like have I, is all of the font consistent through my resume? Is there anything that sticks out to you that maybe would, you know, kind of put off somebody looking at your resume? Um, your resume is your first presentation to any organization. So if there's any um, any errors or any like, you know, missed font, um, it's obviously just like putting a sour taste in the recruiter's mouth. And just bear in mind, um, HR people are probably the most judgmental. So make sure you've got the strongest resume possible. Um, and that's your first step into the door. So um, next, I want to talk about interview tips. And I think this is really important because it's really great when your resume is passed at an initial screen and now you've got the interview. So the one thing that I will say is do your research. So many people lose jobs because they haven't done any research on the organization that they're applying to. So um, recruiting manager can say, what do you know about us? And you're like, um, yeah, I guess you're a not-for-profit or something like that. Like, that is a big no-no and that will get you disqualified, you know, immediately. So do your research on comp on the company, even if they're with recruiting firms, like do your research, like, okay, so I understand, like, you know, you guys have placed a lot of finance people with Robert Half. So what are my chances of getting a job? You know, things like that. Do your research on the organizational structure. That's good talking points when you get into, um, you know, further into the interview stages. Like, okay, so I see uh, there's opportunity for growth because you've got a whole bunch of new, new, new roles. And um, looking at things like projects, um, community initiatives, especially in the time that we live in, you know, what are your community initiatives? How how involved in the community are you? You know, what are the latest news briefings? Look at things like that. Um, I've had situations where my candidates have got roles because they're like, the employer said, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that was going on within our organization, but they're able to tell me that. So being able to do that research is so imperative before you get into an interview. On the flip side, I've also had candidates that have overdone their research and found out, oops, sorry about that and found out what an what a individual's um, you know marital status is or um, <laughs> what's going on in their life oh you've got a dog like that's a little bit awkward so you don't need to do that much research but do do a level of research I don't know if there's a red mark in between this but I'm really sorry about that please disregard that I don't know if everyone else sees that um, another thing that I would say is something that we call an eleva elevator pitch, which is just being able to answer that, tell me about yourself question. Um, an elevator pitch is really great, not only for interviews, but even if you go to networking events, it's not necessarily a hard sale, but it tells an individual when you meet them who you are, what you do, and what you're looking for. You have to keep it concise. People don't have long concentration periods. So um, I would say practicing elevator pitches, like, hi, my name is Viviana, I'm Robert Thompson, I'm for man uh, management level professionals, um, and that's what I'm looking to do in my next role. So, you know, just keep it concise. And being able to do um, I feel like, again, as I said, an elevator pitch is really a great way to just use um, not only in interviews, but since you go to 
talking with different people, um, practicing most questions like what do you, why do you want to work for your for this company? Um, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Where do you in five years? Or what are your career goals? Um, I would say practice, practice, practice because I've had the most technically strong. Um, consultants or individuals lose jobs because they are horrible interviewers. So interviewing is really a skill set in itself. Having a level of confidence that's not cocky, a level of wanting to learn but not seeming like if you don't know what's going on is super important and that will also be built by being able to do your research. Another thing that I just wanted to say, so in, in answering interview questions, um, something that's super cool is the STAR technique. So um, basically answering questions in terms of what the situation was that you faced, what your task was, what action you took, and what was the result, or what did you learn from that situation? Um, so Chi, I don't know, I have a YouTube video that I wanted to share. Do you know if I'd be able to do that? I think you should be able to. Let's see. Let's work out and see. Our luck. So I saw this, um, you know, this video and I thought, can you hear? We can hear, but we can't see anything. Hold on one second. Okay. Can you see it now? No, we can just hear it. Sorry. So now we can see a whole screen, so we might be able to see it now if you... Okay. Okay. Tell me about a time when you had to work with a difficult co-worker. Sure. I was working with a technology associate at a virtual I provided case management services and daily therapeutic intervention and assessment for adult male inmates who all had severe persistent mental health issues. I was getting ready to leave my job because I was moving out of state and I had to train someone to take over on my caseload. The coworker who I was training to take over my caseload was also new to the organization, so she didn't know all the ins and outs of her position. I emailed her to set up several meetings over the course of a few weeks to bring her up to speed. Our first few interactions I thought were somewhat negative. Um, she was very short in her responses to me when I would ask her questions or provide her information, and I thought her speech was very harsh in tone. I originally sort of brushed it off and thought maybe she was just having a bad day and I didn't think too much about it. But as we continued to meet, I thought the interactions became more negative and I started to feel uncomfortable. I would say hello to her, ask her how she was. She would just ignore me and was really rude. Um, at this point, I thought these things, this isn't going well and I was really worried that she wasn't going to be trained well enough for when I left. I thought about it for a few days and I knew I needed to do something, but I wasn't sure that going to my supervisor was really the best course of action because I didn't want to blow the situation out of proportion and I certainly did not want to get her in trouble. I decided I would speak to her privately about it and let her know how I was feeling and try to understand what she was thinking and feeling. I let her know that I thought our meetings were unproductive at this time and I was really worried that she was not going to have all the information and be ready to take over my caseload. I also asked her if there was something that I did that made her feel uncomfortable or upset her and to let me know if there was something I could do better. She told me that, you know, it wasn't me. She apologized. She said she was really stressed out because of some personal issues she was having and that she was feeling very overwhelmed with learning a new job and everything that went along with working at the prison. So I think that this talk was really great because I was able to clear up the communication issues and the conflict that I was feeling. And we were both able to let each other know what we were thinking and what we needed. And because she was feeling overwhelmed with some of the other things she needed to do, I helped her with those and caught, brought her back up to speed. And I thought at the time that I was leaving that she was gonna be ready to take over my caseload and there was gonna be no lapse in treatment for the inmates, which is really the most important thing here. From this experience, I think I really learned that 
taking the initiative to be assertive and address the conflict with a coworker is a really great first step, especially before involving a supervisor or anyone else in the situation. And I also think I gained a lot more confidence when having to deal with conflict with a coworker in similar situations. Great, thank you. Okay, so that's a good um, example of a STAR technique when it comes to um, answering questions. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So I just wanted to showcase that because sometimes it's easy to give a technical, um, technical example. However, just being able to see how she dealt with the situation, the task, the action, and the result. So whenever you're answering interview questions, being able to, I, I brief it by saying where you did it, what you did, and how you did it, and what you accomplished. So being able to really give that spread is super important um, when you're answering questions in an interview setting. Um, another thing with interviews that you need to just take into consideration is as much as you're there for the interview, you're also interviewing the company that you're um, you know, potentially looking at. So, you know, before COVID, when unemployment was super low, it was really, demand was really out well, yeah, demand was outweighing supply. So there was a lot of um, demand for candidates, but not enough candidates, right? But even through this time, it really speaks to what your value is. So as much as you want them to know why they should hire you, you need to know why do you want to work for this organization? So things that you can ask, you know, describe the company culture, position someone, is this a new position or am I replacing someone? Is there an opportunity? permanent? Is there an opportunity for growth in the organization? Um, what does success look like in this role? Um, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses um, as a manager? Or what are some of the things that keep you up as a manager? Because if you if they say, oh, well, um, we've got we've got a going concern issue, that's a company you probably don't want to work for, right? I also say to everyone, if you are interested in the organization, um, express your interest like it's you know you don't need to play hard to get or anything like that just say like this is something that you see yourself really being interested in um and also talk about what are the next steps um believe it or not i do have candidates that have asked these questions and that's why i put them as to what not to um during an interview like why would i want to work here negative connotation how much money am I going to make? Don't talk salary until you know you get to that stage or until they bring it up. Um, and then again, at that point, you've done your research as to what your salary band expectation should be. Um, how late is too late to show up to work? I've actually had a candidate ask that question and surprise, surprise, he didn't get the job. Um, when can I retire? So all of the things like just, you know, use common sense when you're in an interview stage, uh, because a lot of the times like, you know, interviews are conversations. People want to make sure that they're hiring people that they can get along with. 77% um, of the time, employers hire people based solely on fit. And that fit is gauged through interviews, through the discussions, through the questions that you ask during the interview. Um, so once the interview is all done, um, some post-interview adequate that I would say is, you know, write a thank you note. Some people don't do that, some people do. I think it's really important, even if you're working with a recruiting manager. Um, if you've met multiple people, make sure that you're writing individual notes to just say thank you to each one. Um, it's also a good time to re-express your interest in the role. So yes, I'm 100% you know, interested in what your, what your organization, I've done this research and I think this is where I wanna be. Um, it's also a good time to clarify any afterthoughts. I think we've all left um, interviews where we're like, oh, dang it, I probably should have said this. So being able to just be like, oh, so, you know, after consideration, I just wanted to let you know, these are my thoughts on um, how I would deal with the situation within your organization that you're looking for. 
address any concerns that the interviewer express on your candidacy. Like, oh, we're looking for somebody with five years of experience, knowing that you've got three years experience. Being able to be like, well, listen, I only have three years of experience, but I am driven to get to that stage. I'm going to take X, Y, Z courses to make sure that I'm the right candidate for you. Um, mentioning something that you liked about the interview, be it learning more about the organization. So just being able to re, um, kind of reiterate that. Um, the most important thing is you don't want to write a novel, just write it as a quick note, a quick email. So keep it concise. A lot of people have a hard time with what the subject line would be, which is like I say some suggestions is thank you for your time. Great speaking with you, following up. Um, if you're working with a recruiting firm, I definitely urge you to add your recruiters onto LinkedIn. Now, talk about learning and development really quickly. Um, through this time, so it's such an essential time to make sure that you're learning and developing even in your own career path. There's a lot of online resources like Udemy, EDX, Shaw Academy, uh, Robert Half itself. We've got a skill support um, software or like a portal rather where you're able to advance your skills by if you're registered with Robert Half, upgrade your certifications, um, learn a new language. If, if you're living in a bilingual city, um, obviously, you may, well, maybe your bilingualism will not get to a point where you're fluently bilingual, but being able to upgrade that during this COVID time, data science and computer science, such hot, hot, hot industries to be in right now. So if there's any way and you're trying to try diff something different, this is a good time to do that. Um, if you are a leader in your organization, Robert Half offers some Zoom updates for leaders in terms of how to deal with the COVID situation because believe it or not, a lot of your managers don't know what to do through this time. So we're able to offer these things. Um, things like working remotely, what a lot of other organizations are doing. Um, Robert Half spends so much resources in being able to uh, provide these um, this information to leaders. So being able to do that and sign up, advise your manager, suggest that to your manager, I think that would really get you some brownie points too. Um, as well as right now, software to know, um, Excel, Microsoft Excel, regardless of what industry you're in, Excel is really a hot, uh, a hot, uh, software to know as well as Power BI because a lot of companies are dealing with big data. So having that on you is really great. Quickly want to touch on resources for job hunters. So salary guides, know what your worth is. As I've mentioned before, there's a lot of online training, as I said in the previous slide, um, and doing workplace research and articles. Um, finally, I definitely want to talk about um, some of the networking. Um, really, as Tim Sanders said, your network is your net worth. So networking on LinkedIn, professional associations, um, community associations such as BCW, super important during this time. Um, meeting up, like meetup groups within different organ, like within different associations, as well as Toastmasters. Uh, it's really, really imperative to just network as much as possible through this time, because maybe that's where you'll find your new job opportunity. I know I'm cutting short on time, Sochi. <laughs> I can see that. I just quickly want to touch on LinkedIn before um, you know I, I open the floor for any questions. Um, LinkedIn is so important, you guys. Like I feel like I need to get paid by LinkedIn by how much I talk about the importance of LinkedIn. Make sure your LinkedIn is, key, is kept updated. Um, use a professional photo. I've seen some individuals using their Snapchat filters for photos. Don't do that. Create a summary, you know, use targeted words. Right now, hashtag ready to work is really important on LinkedIn right now because we're able to see new candidates that are available. Um, ask your peers and your uh, former managers for any recommendations and sign up for any job hiring updates and any alerts. Um, thank you so, so much for your time, everyone. <laughs> that ends it. I think I'm right at 50 minutes. <laughs> I told Sochi initially that I won't even be able to talk for 45 minutes, but clearly I've surprised myself. Um, add me on LinkedIn, send me an email if you need to. Um, that's my direct phone number in my office. And if you wanna text me, that's my cell phone number. And at this point, I'll open the floor for questions. Awesome. Be everyone, thank you so, so much. Really grateful that we've had this conversation. Um, definitely some tips.
Well, we have about eight minutes and I'm being very respectful of people's time. So I'm going to try and shoot through the questions that we have in the chat first. If you could please go back to your um, previous slide, Viviana, just with your details perfect. Just so that if people, we don't have enough time, people can contact you directly to ask some of these questions. So just going through. So following the question I asked you in regards to stats, um, right now people from our communities are not only content with any position because they are well skilled, well qualified and competent. So they want to be hired on the position they deserve and be paid equally. So how do you deal with that in the real world? Sorry, um, so in regard to equal pay? In regards to equal pay, in regards to um, just knowing that you are skilled, you're well qualified, you're competent and you want to be hired um, for that position that you've trained for, that you've worked so hard for, yet sometimes maybe it's because we, um, we've immigrated here, whether it's because we just don't have Canadian experience, where just different anomalies come, come, you know, affect that. How do we work with that? Well, you know what, to be honest, I think it's just building relationships with your managers and being able to have that open conversation. Um, even in my industry right now, I find like a lot of people that are minorities who just got here um, and a lot of new immigrants say, oh, I need to get a starter job. Like there's no such thing. I have placed people right out of their home countries into positions that they were in where they were, you know, back at home. Right? it's all a mindset if you change your mindset and just go have that honest conversation and again show proof as to why you're worthy of x amount and do your research know how much you're worth on the market it's it's easy to have those conversations with your manager it's just having that confidence to step out and say listen I know this is what I've done and I want to see what your thoughts are on me having a pay increase Okay, thank you. I'm going to get to the next question. From your experience, do you think black women need to have a stronger skill set, and that's in quotes, than the average person applying for a role to get the same job? Or that companies expect more from minorities versus our counterparts? Um, <laughs> wow, that's, that, that's a really great question. I mean, if I'm, if I'm to be completely transparent, yes, Unfortunately, that's the hardship we face. As I mentioned earlier, fit is one of the biggest reasons why people make hires. It's also one of the biggest reasons why people get promotions or get, um, you know, any upgrades within their own, um, you know, organizations. So if you don't fit into the natural culture already, um, there is those hardships and there's that ba like that backlash from management to say, oh, we're not going to promote you right now. But I think it's just the level of confidence that you show. And I feel like sometimes, you know, it's not to say like, oh, do as the Rome, uh, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. But it's that level of that, right? I do see like there's a lot of backlash and it is a lot harder, but how you can prove yourself is in your work ethic. Um, right now, actually in, in, in Ottawa, um, Mitel, which is one of the biggest companies within Ottawa, they've just had their first black CFO who's a female. So for that to even happen within the Ottawa market, that speaks volumes. And that just speaks on one's confidence to get that. So know what you're looking for and just ask for it. Okay, thank you so much. There's so many really interesting questions. Um, and I don't think we're gonna have time to get through all of them. I'm trying my best. One though, would you be sharing your slide with us? Because a lot of people really like the tips that you shared. So is there any way you could share your slide with us so we can send it out to you? Yeah. Agree. Okay, awesome. And again, if you've got any questions after this talk, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I want to see our community growing. I want to see us doing better. I want to see us in leadership, leadership positions. So I'm super passionate about that. So feel free to reach out to me. Okay, and the last question, just before we have to sign off, do you find that there's discrimination when someone uses their native name on their resume? I've often found people will put an English nickname in fear that just by their name, they won't get screened into the job. You know what's so funny? Um, typically, 
the only reason why there's discrimination is because the hiring managers sometimes are too embarrassed to try pronounce names, right? So they'll be like, oh, we'll just look past it. Is there discrimination? Sometimes there is. Yeah, um, it does happen depending on organizations. If you come through our recruiting firm, I know, trust me, any, any, any name that's native, I will still screen you in um, depending on experience. Um, but right now, a lot of companies, and it's super funny because some people in my network have been reaching out to me to be like, hey, do you know any black organizations? We're trying to like have a push for more uh, minorities within our organization. So right now, if your name is an African name, put it on your resume because you will get that job. <laughs> <laughs> definitely with what's going on right now, definitely with the movement. So I'm, I'm really glad that we could have this conversation. I just really want to thank um, everyone for signing in today, everyone for being part of this conversation. Um, it was a great presentation, so many takeaways, so many tips to go home with. So thank you so much, Bibiana. This is, as we said, a series of six that we're doing. Um, this is our second one. We have about four more left, which we'll be talking about health tips. We'll be talking about marketing tips for relaunch. And we'll be talking about financial literacy as well. So some great conversations, some great topics going on. Bibiana is going to send us her slide. Slides. Sorry, I'm trying to make people in that's still coming in. You are going to send us your slides. Um, you do have your information up. So please, 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 if you have any further questions that she can help answer directly, that would be really great. Do connect with her directly. Um, exactly. We're going to be doing a some of the questions that we didn't get through on the chat we're going to make sure that we answer them and post them and we'll let you guys know where we post them do sign on to bcwinaction.com you would find out more information of other things we're doing um, register with us just be a part of our journey with bcw in action thank you very much bibiana any last words no i just want to thank you minutes <laughs> for uh, being here today. I really, really appreciate everyone resharing their posts and everything to have this opportunity to talk to, um, you know, Black Canadian women across um, Canada. It's been an absolutely amazing. Thank you, Anesu, for plugging me into this. So um, again, I'm super passionate about what I do. Any opportunity for me to talk about it, I'm more than happy to connect with me on LinkedIn, get my number, and um, I'm more than happy to give you any resume tips and give you any feedback where you need. Awesome, thank you. Once again, we've posted the bcwinaction.ca website information on our chat. We have Anesu too. And she's posted her email on our chat too if you want more information or want to stay in contact. Thank you everyone so much and we hope you have an enjoyable rest of your day. Thank you.